Australian um, about magnetic unmixing and challenges and what's going on there. So Dave, if you wanna share your screen. Okay, thanks Anna. Get started. Ever nerve wracking screen share. Let's see what goes, if this works. Okay, can you see me okay? Yep. Yep, okay, and you can see the mouse okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, as advertised, I'm gonna be talking about unmixing of magnetic mineral assemblages and importantly, the challenges that we face in trying to approximate reality. Um, so quick outline, a very brief review of IRM and mixing. I'm sure that's something that you're all familiar with already. And aspects that I want to deal with in more detail are the uncertainties associated with these models, uh, model non-uniqueness and model complexity. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, again, I'm going to talk about challenges, specifically, how do we identify the components that these models provide us with, and then more challenges and limitations as we move forward. Now, I think with this audience, I'm kind of preaching to the converted. So a lot of the things I'm going to say, you might think are kind of obvious anyway. So I'm going to try and keep you awake, but particularly for the people in Europe, please try to stay with me. I'll do my best. Okay. So a quick review of IRM and mixing. And first case is single sample and mixing where we do so-called parametric unmixing. And the idea is that we try to estimate the coercivity distribution of a given sample, for example, by IRM acquisition or maybe AFD magnetization of an ARM. And then we take the derivative of that information to provide us with a coercivity distribution, which is kind of shown in, in red here for this example on the left-hand side. And then we fit some form of mathematical function to that coercivity distribution. So for example, a collection of log normal distributions are suggested by Robertson and France and then Crowver et al. And in combination, we hope that these components provide us with a good approximation to the coercivity distribution. We then use these different components to draw inferences about the composition of our magnetic mineral assemblage. For example, each component might be a different mineral or a different domain state and, and so on. Now, moving on a little bit from that was the uh, a different family of dif distributions to use as the so-called skewed generalized Gaussian components first suggested by Egli and Lowry and then worked on a lot by Ramon in uh, 2004 and, and since. And we have good theoretical information that tells us that actually these components that we see when we're trying to fit the coercivity distribution should be skewed. Uh, for example, due to thermal relaxation and, and processes like that. So Ramon developed this distribution where you can introduce skewness as well. And what you find is these typically provide a very nice fit to the data. And then as before, you make an interpretation about what each component might represent in your sample. So this is all pretty uh, familiar stuff. Um, I'm only going to briefly touch on non-parametric unmixing. The idea is that rather than fitting mathematical functions, instead you get a collection of samples. So in the work by Just et al. here in 2012, they had 177 IRM acquisition curves. And by looking at the variability between those curves, you can define so-called N members. And the idea is then that any given sample in your collection can be described by a linear combination of those N members. So if you uh, look down core in this example here, um, you can work out how much each N member is, for example, contributing to your IRM. And therefore you get this unmixing down core under this assumption that you have common N members in all of your samples. Now, an important point on this, and I think sometimes one that's underappreciated is that the N members themselves may actually be mixtures. So there's no reason that a given N member has to be a single mineral or single domain state, et cetera. Um, and that can make interpretation difficult. So recently, in, in, uh, in fact, just last year, he et al. Um, used this hybrid form of unmixing where they first did this non-parametric N members and then fitted the N members using these single sample approaches in order to try and deconvolve the N members into their component parts. Like I said, I'm, I'm not gonna talk much about non-parametric unmixing. I'm mostly interested in this single sample case where we're using these mathematical functions to fit the coercivity distributions. So as I mentioned, the kind of standard approach now is to use these skewed generalized Gaussian distributions. And we can describe these distributions in terms of their moments. And the moments are, for example, the mean, the standard deviation, skewness, and kurtosis. So it's really 
where is our distribution located? How big is it? How, and what is its shape? So mean and standard deviation are obvious, but the nice thing about the SGG is you can introduce this extra parameter Q, which describes the skewness of the distribution. Wow. So, so um, what you'll see is that as we move Q here, we go from when Q equals one, we have a symmetrical distribution, through to uh, Q 0.4, and that gives us quite a strongly negative skewed distribution. Ketosis is just how peaked the distribution is. So this is P describing the ketosis. When it's infinity, we get it's flat, and we go all the way up to P equals one, where we get this very peaked distribution. So that's where the distribution parameters are particularly intuitive. We, we can say it's mean, standard deviation, skewness, and ketosis, and we kind of know what they mean in terms of distribution shape. Now, a suggestion that Ramon made in, in 2004 was actually we often skewness and ketosis are closely related to each other. So he said, you can just parameterize ketosis based on the skewness of your distribution. So if we plot for the SGG, the skewness of the SGG versus its ketosis based on this parameterization, what we can see is when we're here with a skewness parameter of one, that's actually just the normal distribution. So it's symmetrical. And as we increase, towards positive skewness in this direction, you can see the ketosis increases. This axis is inverted, I should point out. And in this direction, as we increase towards negative skewness, the ketosis increases as well. So we've got this really uh, simple relationship between skewness and ketosis describing the shape of our distribution. So once we get into actually fitting a coercivity distribution, what for each component, SGG component, what we're doing is estimating its contribution to the overall uh, coercivity distribution, its mean, its standard deviation, and its skewness. And we do that for each component in our model. Now, one of the challenges of these kind of analyses is that we have to um, estimate the gradient of, for example, our IRM acquisition data in order to prov provide us with those, um, with the coercivity distribution. And of course, we're not actually measuring a gradient, we're estimating it from the data. So we can have some lovely smooth data like here on acquisition on the left hand side, but then when you estimate its gradient, some of it's okay, but it gets really noisy in the high field component. And again, this isn't a big surprise. We know that taking the derivative is going to amplify the measurement noise, but I think an aspect or a complication of this that is less well appreciated is that this operation to estimate the gradient also introduces correlation into the errors that we see here. So the errors associated with those gradient estimates. And a lot of these fitting algorithms assume that our errors are so-called independent and identically distributed. Um, but when we take the gradient, that isn't the case. These errors actually become correlated to each other. And that can be a problem when we start trying to deal with the statistics of, of how to fit these data. And what do we do if we have a really bad sample? So this is a real sample. And I've estimated the derivative and you can see it's basically useless. Well, the obvious answer in that situation is we smooth the data. And this is typically what people do a lot in order to get a nice smooth coercivity distribution. But then you have all kinds of questions. Well, what type of smoothing are you going to use? For example, a cubic spline or, or something else. And what effect does that smoothing actually have? How much are you going to smooth the data? And might that hide features and possibly smear features out that you're interested in? How's it going to affect your model uncertainty? So you may put a, a really strong smoothing through your data, you get this lovely smooth coercivity distribution, but if your data was really uncertain to begin with, how is that going to be represented in your model when you're just using a smooth version of the data set? And building on that, how is it going to affect non-uniqueness? It could be in really noisy data that you have multiple different models that fit the data equally well, but then based on some smoothing that you kind of chose arbitrarily, suddenly it looks like you maybe just have one feasible model. And this leads into a concept that's now gaining traction in fields of data processing and statistics. And it's this idea of the so-called the garden of forking paths put together by Gelman and Locken. And the point they make is that often as we go through sequences of data processing, we make arbitrary decisions. For example, how am I gonna smooth my data? To what extent am I going to smooth my data? That maybe we, do somewhat subjectively, and we don't think 
in too much detail about what the consequences of those data processing steps are. And they make the point that often these choices that we make during the modeling process maybe affect the conclusions of our papers as much as the data does. So we need to pay more attention to these kind of things and, and consider the knock-on effects that they're going to have. So often in a paper, you might see a statement such as, the IRM data was smooth. That's the end of the information we've got. But the obvious questions are, well, what type of smoothing? Um, how did you select the smoothing parameters that were going to be used? Often even the unsmooth data are not shown. So you don't know to what extent the smoothing may have distorted um, the actual acquisition data that we're interested in. And I've seen a few cases recently where no data is shown and people simply report the model and say it fitted the data. And that's the end of the argument. So you've got, again, no appreciation of how the model actually corresponds to the data. I think one place uh, where this was given a lot of thought was, again, in um, Ramon and Bill Lowry's paper in 2003, where they developed this algorithm, the coercivity distribution calculator where they considered how to estimate the gradient and the uncertainties associated with that gradient. So you can see, again, this is the example that we looked at earlier. We've got the estimated gradient in red and the thickness of the shading demonstrates the uncertainties. Now, there's a very important point here, and I think people might be surprised that I'm saying this, but good data is always going to trump statistics. Statistics are not some silver bullet for solving all your problems associated with poor data. So the best thing that you can do is try to get as good quality data as you possibly can and then avoid the need for any kinds of smoothing and so on. And just to give an appreciation of that, in Ramon's paper in 2004, where he was showing these kind of examples, each sample took three days of measurement to complete. And that was because they did repeat measurements and repeat measurements and repeat measurements in order to improve their signal to noise ratio. And when you consider often we maybe look at a DCD curve uh, measured on a micromag that takes maybe 20 minutes, then clearly there's gonna be a big data quality difference between that and a process that takes three days. So wherever possible, get the best data that you can and that's gonna solve a lot of your uh, modeling problems. But estimating the gradient is, is difficult and then working with noisy gradients is, is difficult. And this is a paper by Jowatel in 2018 and they came up with a, an alternative approach using the so-called Burr distribution. And this is the Burr distribution here. We, we don't need to go to, into it in detail, but you can see it's got a relatively simple form as a function of the applied field and these three parameters, alpha, omega, and lambda. And the nice thing about the Burr distribution in this form is it's a cumulative distribution function. So we can fit the acquisition data directly with components and we don't actually need to take the gradient. So this removes all these problems of estimating gradients, smoothing data, and so on. If we want to, then we can then readily take the derivative of the model and illustrated as a derivative, if that's a preferred method for visualization. But the key thing is we're fitting the acquisition curve directly, for example, by maximum likelihood. We don't need to worry about correlated errors in gradients or smoothing or anything like that. So th that's really helpful. Now we talked about the moments of the SGG earlier, that was the mean standard deviation, skewness and so on. Unfortunately, the moments of the Burr distribution are really complicated. So this is a paper by Rodriguez, 1977. Again, a plot of skewness against kurtosis. And you can see, depending on these alpha, omega, and lambda parameters, we get all these different paths through this kind of shape space, depending on what we set the parameters as being. Now, Jowatel do provide feasible intervals for where these three parameters should be. But I think one of the difficulties is First of all, they're not intuitive. So when we're dealing with means and standard deviations and skewness, we all have a good idea of kind of what that represents. And if we change a parameter in a certain direction, what is gonna to happen to our distribution? For alpha, omega, and lambda, it's much more complicated. Um, so these parameters are non-intuitive and importantly, they're not unique either. So you can get various different combinations of these three parameters that will give you exactly the same distribution. So this distribution has many advantages, but one of the big disadvantages is actually the way that the parameters are expressed in that distribution. So this is something I've been working on recently to re-parameterize the Burr distribution in terms of 
parameters that are much more intuitive. So specifically the mean, the standard deviation and the skewness. And the way that I tried to develop this transformed Burr distribution was to get it to approximate the skewed generalized Gaussian as closely as possible. So again, we're in this kind of shape space where we're comparing distribution skewness to kurtosis. The, as before, the black line is the SGG. And like I said, I've parameterized this transformed Burr in such a way that it's skewness and kurtosis closely track that of the SGG. Hopefully, like I said, being able to work in terms of mean, standard deviation, and skewness is a much more intuitive approach to working with the Burr than alpha, omega, and lambda. And when we look at some examples, I'm, I've plotted derivatives here, but of course, in terms of the Burr, we're actually working with the, uh, the full acquisition curve, but I'm just displaying it in terms of gradients. What I've done is calculated different SGGs and shown you the most closely approximating transformed Burr distribution in red. So uh, the black is the SGG, and like I said, the Burr is the red. So when we have this symmetrical distribution, you can see the transformed Burr does a really good job of uh, approximating the SGG. But as the skewness increases, we start to get you know, mismatching. This is about as skewed as we'd ever expect a normal uh, or a typical um, component to be. And you can see there is some mismatch here, but the bird does a reasonable job, or the transformed bird does a reasonable job of approximating the SGG. Now, this leads us into a pretty obvious question is, well, how is that helpful? We've already got the SGG and all you've done is taken the Burr and transformed it into a way that it approximates the SGG. So why not just work with the SGG in the first place? Well, there's two main reasons for that. The first one, of course, is that the Burr allows us to work directly on the acquisition data. I think the second most important point or the second and most important point is that the transform Burr makes automated Bayesian inference tractable. And this is what I'm going to talk about next. But the simplicity of that Burr equation means that we can readily put it into a Bayesian framework to make inference about these mixing models. So what are the advantages of Bayesian analysis? The first one is that as a natural part of the Bayesian approach, we can encode prior knowledge as part of our model. So working with these kind of models, we have over 20 years worth of experience now of how we expect distribution parameters to behave in terms of means, standard deviation, and skewness. So using a Bayesian approach, we can actually encode that hard-won knowledge into our model. So for example, in terms of skewness, we know a lot of components that we see are negatively skewed, but very rarely are they positively skewed. And if they are positively skewed, it's, only, it's very slightly. So, for example, we can develop a, a probability function here that represents our prior knowledge about the extent of skewness we expect in these different components. And of course, we can do the same thing for standard deviations and means. So these, are, these distributions are actually based on my going through the literature and collating information and then getting probability functions that kind of approximate the knowledge that we already have. And like I said, in a Bayesian framework, that knowledge is naturally encoded into the model. But importantly, these, these last two points, in a Bayesian framework, we quantify uncertainties, again, naturally as part of the model. And that includes parameter correlations, which allow us to identify non-uniqueness. So let's look at an example. This is a peridotite data from Zhao et al. 2018. The data is the circles. And I've used the transform Burr in this Bayesian framework using this Pi MC3 language to create this Bayesian model for the mixture. And what you can see is there's two components and their uncertainties represented by the shading. And then the final model is represented by the thick black line here. Now, importantly, in a Bayesian model, we don't simply get the best fitting model we get a distribution of models. And that distribution of models represents all the models that are feasible given the uncertainty in the data. So what you're actually seeing here in the thick black line is a distribution of models. The thing is they're all so similar to each other that they just appear as one thick black line. Okay. And I'll come onto that in a moment. But again, this distribution of models is represented by the shading in the components. And that's you know, a distribution of uncertain or distributions of contributions, means, standard deviations, skewnesses, and so on. Of course, I can also show it as a gradient if I want, simply by taking the derivative of, of this model. 
So this is the distribution of the model parameters based on the Bayesian sampling. And what you can see is each of these crosses represents one model. So I've got a collection of a thousand models that within the uncertainty of the data fit the data equally well or effectively equally well. So I get a distribution of parameters for my model, but you can also see some of the parameters are correlated to each other. So for example, this is the abundance of component one in this plot versus the mean of component one. So if I increase the abundance of component one, that can be compensated for by decreasing the mean of component one, and I still get a really good fit to the data. Similarly, in an interaction between the components, this is the mean of component one versus the um, abundance of component two. So if I push up the mean of component one, I can compensate for that by increasing the mean, uh, sorry, the abundance of component two and still get a good fit to the data. So importantly, these distributions are not just telling me about uncertainties, but they're also telling me about non-uniqueness in my model solution. And what I can see here is I could actually move these components around a reasonable amount and still get an equally good fit to the data. Now, here's a horrible example that I'd never actually try to analyze, but this is just um, to try to demonstrate this problem of non-uniqueness where we have multiple solutions that are gonna fit the data equally well. So this is an Australian June sample. It's really noisy because it's so weak. But again, I did the Bayesian analysis with the transform bird distribution. And these are the two components that I get out, the pink and the blue. And the model fits, you can now see because of the uncertainty, it's not just a single black line, but the shading represents the distribution model fits. So you'd say, well, the model fits, maybe they do a reasonable job of going through the data. As I said, the data is terrible, but you can really see the model non-uniqueness in terms of the shading or distribution of these components. So real variability is possible in these components and I'd still be able to get achieve a fit to the data. Okay, so that's a real problem with non-uniqueness because of noise. Imagine that I was working with the gradients, I just wouldn't be able to get anything with this gradient. So then maybe I've smoothed the data and then I'm fitting a model to it, but we know that there's a real problem with non-uniqueness with this data. So then we have to ask, ask ourselves, what would the knock-on effect of that smoothing be? And that's rather difficult to quantify. Now, here's another example of an Australian June sample. Again, nice acquisition data. I fitted my transform burrs using a Bayesian framework and they fit the data very well. And you can see very little shading here suggesting that we're not really struggling with non-uniqueness. These components are well-defined within the model. But now we hit the other question, um, how many components should we include? Two looks pretty good, but we reached this problem of model complexity. So two looks good, but should I maybe use three? Should I maybe use four? So just as an example, now on the left-hand side is the fit I just showed you, but on the right-hand side using, again, the same framework, I fitted three components. You can see the non-uniqueness becomes more of an issue in the, uh, when I add in that third component, but I do get a better fit to the data. So on here, I'm showing the mismatch in the two component model between the um, data and the model. And you can see this is kind of systematic sinusoid offset between the data and the model. Whereas if I do the same thing with my three component model, I get a pretty good fit throughout. Now that isn't a big surprise. If I add an extra component into the model, naturally I'm gonna improve my fit to the data. So we're then looking to strike a balance between is it worth adding another component into the data or can that be justified given the improvement in the fit that it gives? And there's a number of statistical criteria, so-called model selection criteria that have been used to try and make this assessment of how many components should be in the model. The problem with the vast majority of these criteria is that when you're comparing models, they assume that the true model is actually available. So one of the models you're showing the criteria is actually the true model. And that just doesn't mean it's true in terms of I've selected the right number of components. It means it's true in terms of I've also got the right kind of distribution to model my coercivity components as well. So it could be that an SGG or a transform Burr or a log normal distribution just 
are not the right distributions to use. And then when we start using these selection criteria, they're gonna give us a spurious answer because we're not able to show them the true model. So this is then another problem in terms of non-uniqueness. You know, should we be thinking about a two component model or a three component model that may fit the data approximately the same and so on? How do we actually make that decision? And, and I'm afraid there isn't a simple answer to this, but I'm, I'm gonna come on to what is hopefully a kind of pragmatic solution. So hopefully what I've demonstrated is that we can fit the data pretty well and we can pull out these components that you know, have certain mathematical characteristics. This is an important quote, I think, in the direction that we need to be aiming, and it's by Samuel Carlin. The purpose of models is not to fit the data, but to sharpen the questions. So we have a number of algorithms now where we can get great fits to the data. And that's actually the easy part of the problem, getting a fit to the data. The difficult part of the problem is working out what that model tells you in terms of reality. So of course, in our reality, it's what is our mineral assemblage in terms of uh, you know, mineral type, domain state, and, and so on. And I think this goes back to the work of Roy Thompson in 1986. And at least to my knowledge, this is the first kind of attempt to do this numerical and mixing. And what Roy did was he had type curves for hematite and magnetite of different grain sizes and their IRM acquisition. And he used those to then look at IRM acquisition in soils and estimate the relative amounts of magnetite and hematite in these different grain sizes in the soils. Again, you can see it's got great fits to the data. So we have about 35 years worth of algorithms to unmix coercivity spectra into components. And of course, this fitting provides us with a very important platform, but it doesn't tell us about what is the mineralogy, what is the domain state of the components. Roy's approach did that to some extent because he, he was referring to hematites and magnetites of different sizes. But when we do these typical single sampler mixing with SGGs or Burr distributions or whatever, it's not providing us with information about mineralogy, domain state, and so on. So there are some uh, approaches we could take. For example, this is a one from, again, by Ramon in 2004, coercivity-based mineral domain state identification. And based on analysis of a large variety of samples, Ramon kind of defined these empirical zones within this plot of the median destructive field of ARM against this grain size uh, proxy. And then use these classifications, for example, biogenic soft magnetofossils, biogenic hard magnetofossils, pedogenic material, and so on. Now, I'm pretty sure these classification regions are only meant to be indicative, not definitive. So if you get a point for one of your components that falls in this region, that implies it, it is maybe biogenic soft, but it's by no means as sufficient evidence to demonstrate that you have biogenic soft magnetofossils, just as an example. And I think the difficulties with trying to identify components purely on the basis of their coercivity is illustrated by this paper uh, from Roberts et al. last year, where again they referred to the hematite data from the Thompson paper and some more recently measured hematites. And what you can see is that some of these hematites are actually really soft. So when you get into these kind of uh, coercivity distributions and modeling components, often hematite and magnetite can have strongly overlapping coercivity distributions. And the kind of reasoning we, we may have where we say, oh, well, this component has a coercivity less than 100 millitesla, therefore it must be magnetite, just seems to be wrong. It, work like this demonstrates the difficulty we have in trying to recognize minerals, domain states, and so on, purely on the basis of their coercivities. So again, coming back to uh, Ramon's plot here, um, Again, imagine we've identified an IRM component, it's narrow, it's got a coercivity of about 40 millitesla. So we might say, okay, we've got biogenic soft, but that isn't the case. All we've done is fit a model. And this is where we need to follow Carlin's suggestion. We need to sharpen the question. So that means once we've got this component and we've got a hypothesis that it might be biogenic soft material, we now need to design an experiment to either confirm or refute the presence of soft magnetofossils in our sample. So it's all about sharpening the question rather than fitting the data. And this is an example um, from some work we did back in 2013 
talk briefly about forks, but we had we measured these fork diagrams in marine sediments and we identified the central ridge. So said, okay, we've got magnetofossils because of the central ridge, and we drew kind of inferences about this and, and so on. And then the reviewer came back and they said, well, you don't have magnetofossils. What you have is a fork central ridge. So you need to add in an extra experiment to actually demonstrate that you do have magnetofossils. And at the time, I thought the reviewer was being a little bit pedantic, but now I agree with them completely that what we had to do was use this information to sharpen our questions and design a new experiment. And that naturally was TEM, which we then did and demonstrated that we had these uh, magnetofossils in there. So it's not the question of the data, but how do we actually go and make inference about what these components are? And finally, I just want to touch on this recent work by Jinhua Li, um, classification of a complexly mixed magnetic mineral assemblage in Pacific Ocean surface sediment by electron microscopy and supervised magnetic and mixing. I really suggest that you read this paper. Um, and they make a lot of statements that I think we'd all agree with. For example, unambiguous magnetic mineral identification in sediments is a prerequisite for reconstructing paleomagnetic and paleoenvironmental information from magnetic parameters. But what they did was take this one sample and they looked at it under various electron microscopy techniques and identified eight different titanomagnetite and magnetite particle sizes based on morphology, size, um, and so on, which they said are indicative of their origin. So there's actually eight different components in this sample, um, of which they hypothesized four can actually retain a remnant. So when we look at the IRM analysis up here, they just did a standard single sample fitting with four log normal components, and this is what they get. And it's a nice fit to the data. When they do the same model with SGG components, they actually find that you only need two components to also get a nice fit to the data. But we know a priori there is four components in the sample. So then we bring into question slightly about what is a component in this model versus what we'd actually think of as being a mineral component in our assemblage. What they were then able to do is based on that electron microscopy data is constrain the model fitting. So it reduced a lot of the ambiguity associated with these models and they produced a new model constrained by the electron microscopy. And what you can see is, okay, we've still got four log normal components. There's some slight similarities, but in particular, if you compare the cyan and the pink colors here, you can see these models are dramatically different. Where this model at the top is based on just getting the best, ma best mathematical fit to the data this model is constrained by a priori information based on the electron microscopy. So if we only had this model, we'd clearly be making spurious inferences based on the model fit rather than sharpening the question and using other information to constrain the fit. So to conclude, in the first part of the talk, I showed how we can place sample and mixing in a Bayesian framework. Key points with that is, first of all, we don't need gradients. That hopefully avoids the need to smooth and all the various uncertainties associated with that. Importantly, we can incorporate prior knowledge. Like I said, this is hard won knowledge over about 20 years of how these components should behave. So we can build that naturally into the model. And of course, with the Bayesian framework, we can quantify uncertainties and we can get an idea of model non-uniqueness. But, all of these models are just models, they're not reality. So what we should be doing is using them to sharpen our questions. And I think we can do that in two ways. First of all is to get an unmixing model and from that look at the components and formulate new hypotheses or design experiments to actually test what those components might be, as the example I showed with the biogenic soft material. Or secondly, if the components are known a priori, then we can create the supervised model that aids in quantification. And that's what we saw in, just in the work by Lee et al. But I think if we simply use these models where we fit coercivity components and then infer just simply on the basis of coercivity what the mineral is or what the domain state is, then I think we're going to be struggling to actually make realistic um, interpretations about what our magnetic mineralogy is. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, 
I, I guess colleagues might think, you know, with all of the different statistical models, et cetera, we might be going down a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, but, but I want to make the point um, before opening up to questions that, that in environmental magnetism, quantifying the components that we have is really key to what we're doing. And when you've got ambiguity about the number of components, which model to fit, experimental uh, uncertainty and all of the rest um, and all the remote sensing that we do as a discipline without the ground truthing by electron microscopy, we're actually dealing with a really complex and difficult problem. Um, and when we see, you know, when we do our first geophysics course at university and, and, and we understand that that inverse modeling is fundamentally non-unique uh, and, and then in all of our papers, we're presenting component fits to IRM acquisition curves. I think you can see the danger of what we're doing. So I, I think this is a really fundamentally important issue that we need to grapple with better as a community. So, um, so thanks, Dave, for that. Uh, Kathy, you, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said, Andrew, and uh, nice talk, Dave. Um, I have a question about your very last example. Mm -hmm. where you said that you used prior information to sharpen the quantification of the same four, as I understood it, the same contributions. Uh, and I was wondering what the prior information is. Is it a limitation on the uh, relative amount or what exactly is it? Uh, well, this, this is where, as a co-author, Andrew might be able to... Uh answer that question a little bit more clearly than me, but because they had all previously identified what these components were and mm -hmm. the distributions of, for example, particle sizes in those components. So they did a lot of um, electron microscopy work where they, they also quantified, for example, sizes, aspect ratios, and so on. They could get a, a handle on the kind of distributions they expected for these different mineral components that then fed in to the, uh, into the model. So the, the actual quantification part, if I remember correctly, was driven by an ability to fit the data, but mm -hmm. constraining where the components should be and their distributions was then informed by this kind of particle counting and, and particle characterization process in the electron microscopy. Okay. Kathy, did you, did you want to follow up? Um, I, I think I'll digest that a bit. <laughs> I, it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't really help me, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I understand that you somehow, uh, I mean, basically what you've done is you've changed the shape of those distributions that come out. And I understand that this is fundamentally non-unique. Um, and But did you change the shape of them by virtue of putting constraints on the relative amounts of each kind of particle? So because first of all, it, it wasn't I me. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved. No, well, uh, I'll, I'll talk to Andrew now, if you like. <laughs> so um, to me, supervision of unmixing is really critical here, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, and, and Dave's talked about this extensively in his, his publications and, and particularly in his 2015 review paper on un unmixing. Um, you know, and... and I would argue as a community, we're reasonably good at that. We, we do whatever other analyses are, are required to say, okay, there's hematite, there's a detrital magnetite, there's a, there's a biogenic magnetite, and then, and then we use that information to unmix it. I'm not sure we're very good at constraining the magnitude of each component. And so I, I would say we still have massive uncertainty um, uh, uh, about the amplitude and the width of the distributions that we're fitting. And the, the case from, from the paper by Jinhua that Dave showed left me a bit depressed actually, because you know, what they did in the first draft of the paper was, was fitted the four components that, that everybody does. And I says, wait, wait a minute, if you use a skewed, skewed Gaussian, you probably get only, you get a perfect fit with two components. And sure enough, that's what Dave showed. So you know, which model, um, which function are we fitting uh, how well supervised are we? I, I, I still think we're a long way in most studies from, from constraining uh, the, the unmixing problem. And in this case, Jinhua's team identified eight different magnetic particle types by TEM. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't see that magnetically. So, so I think 
um, the reality is, is, is a really complex one very often. Uh, and I don't think we deal with that very well. Nick? I, I would agree. And yeah. can I just make, make a last comment? I mean, the, the whole thing is constrained by the number of things that you look for, because if you used a transdimensional approach to this, you would just end up with thousands of parameters. Um, and, and then our community will probably throw up their hands and say, oh, that's become too complicated for us. Yeah, I, th I think then we, we have to put a prior on the dimension of the problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well. Yeah, if we made it a flat prior, I'd agree, I'd agree with you completely, but uh, yeah. Nick. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the great talk, talk Dave. Um, I guess, yeah, first off, I'm curious whether this code utilizing PyMC3 is uh, avail available out there out there yet for um, this It's still in testing. So it, it got developed a lot while we were under lockdown and I was at home. <laughs> And then as soon as I got back to the office and had a lot more stuff to do, it kind of went on the back boiler for a while. So it, it ultimately will be available. And the next step that I'm actually thinking about is to, um, to do the same things, but with SGGs as well. So that, that's kind of where I am at, at the moment, yeah. Cool, well, it'll be fun, fun to play around with. Um, and then I, yeah, I guess my, my question is whether you're, the sort of prior knowledge you talked about integrating into the Bayesian framework was sort of related to the nature of the shape of the distributions. And then you sort of pointed to the supervised model, model framework of Lee et al. differently. So I guess I'm curious about how you're thinking about integrating prior knowledge, such as that being gained from, from other methods um, yeah. into the Bayesian framework. And I guess a follow on on that is whether sort of ways to, well, I guess it's almost a different different question, but ways where you can uh, throw, instead of a single specimen, right, look at multi-specimens and go in and say, hey, I'm gonna, I think I wanna represent all these data with the same components in, in each yeah. one and to then yeah. invert for, for multiple at the time. Yeah, so I'll kind of answer them maybe in reverse order. You, you certainly could do that. You, you could show the algorithm uh, multiple acquisition curves and solve for N members in the same way as we saw with the kind of the non, well, it would still be a parametric approach because you'd be as, assuming a certain distribution to represent your components, but you could do it in, a, in this kind of hybrid fashion. In terms of the, the prior knowledge, um, from a practical standpoint, it's, it's very easy to incorporate into uh, the way the model works, as long as you've got a probability density function that represents your prior knowledge then it very naturally goes into the model. And that's part of this Pi MC3 framework. It's what we call a probabilistic programming language. So it allows you to set up these Bayesian problems and it goes away and, and solves them for you. So they're very flexible. Um, and then in terms of how we gain that prior knowledge, and I know that, that some people worry about incorporating prior knowledge into a model, but you could say we always have some prior knowledge. For example, the mean of the component must be greater than zero. You know, we'd say that's a reasonable prior that we can introduce, even if it is just that vague, through to the ones that I showed were based on compilations of data in the literature. And then you say, okay, well, this is a broad overview of um, really anything we may expect based on our prior experience through to the final example, which, which wasn't a, a Bayesian fit, but if they'd gone in that direction based on their electron microscopy, they could try to come up with priors um, that represented in some way the knowledge gained from those observations. You do need to be a little bit careful with the priors because if you make them really specific, they just dominate the entire model and the data doesn't really get a chance to speak for itself. So you don't want to make the, the priors really specific but in some way you can, you can rep represent that knowledge, but it always needs to be in terms of probability functions. So you need to be able to encode that knowledge as a probability function. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. so Great. we've kind of run out of time, sorry, Nick. And oh. Miriam and Dario have got hands up, but I guess we'll have to move on and, uh, and hopefully come back and, uh, Andrew, later on. Andrew, it's fine yes. to continue with the questions for a little bit longer. It, if really? we've got a good discussion going, we can, Keep going with the questions. 
Nick, did you have a quick follow up? Otherwise, I'd prefer to move to the. No, no, I guess, uh, yeah, I was just going to say one comment. Sometimes we get good prior some other types of magnetic experiments too, say, uh, say yeah. MPMS or other, other, yeah, sort of inferences. Absolutely. Yeah, to totally agree. Any, and that's necessary, I would say. Any knowledge you have can get built into that prior. You just have to work out how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Miriam. Dave, so I have a general question. And mm -hmm. uh, so should we include electron microscopy all the time in our studies? So, so, do, so should electron microscopy become a routine measurement, like routine analysis when we do environmental magnetism? So you, you, you've hit this interesting question of, let's take the magnetofossils as an example. Maybe I identify a coercivity component in my IRM that I think, oh, maybe that's magnetofossils. So then I do a fork diagram and I find a central ridge, but still I'm gonna to need to do that electron microscopy to actually demonstrate that I've got magnetofossils. So I think it's really, although it's time consuming, I think it's an absolutely crucial tool in this ability to move from a model or from a data set into actual identification of what that component is. Of course, you don't need to do that on all your samples, but if you did it on some appropriately representative samples that allow you to confirm, you know, for example, I do have magnetofossils and therefore I can assume that in the sediments down the column, there's probably magnetofossils in there as well. I think that's reasonable, but yeah, I, I strongly encourage that as probably the most definitive way to identify what components may be. And, and should be TEM. Not Whatever you need. the particle size. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever you need to answer the hypothesis that you have. But like I said, the, these models, they're only going to allow you to formulate hypotheses. So then you need to work out how you're going to address that hypothesis. I, I think it may be oh. worth okay. saying that really quick, you. that you don't yeah. need to necessarily include electron microscopy in, in every application, but I do think you need some sort of supplementary technique, potentially, to at least provide supporting evidence for your interpretation. So in some cases, it may be SEM, in some cases, TEM, in some cases, electron diffraction. Um, but there needs to be some sort of sub supporting data. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dario. Yes, thank you. David, a great talk. I wanted to ask you, so many natural materials tend to demagnetize faster than they acquire magnetization. And this mm -hmm. will lead in differences in distributions and possibly the shapes if you're looking at DCD curves or acquisitions. Yeah. So how do you incorporate a priori knowledge um, given that there is difference? That's a very good point. I mean, often we assume we measure a DCD curve and then we invert it and scale it and, and say, oh, it, it's equivalent to YRM acquisition, which of course it isn't unless you've got non-interacting single domain particles. So yeah, this becomes also a bit of a problem making comparisons in the literature as well, that what one component might look like in a DCD curve might be different in an IRM acquisition curve, for example. So I, I would agree with that point that we need to also think carefully about what the measurement was and what our coercivity distribution represents. Uh, and that isn't always going to be the same depending on the experimental setup. Um, right. So incorporating that into prior knowledge, that would mean we would have to define priors that are either vague enough that they take those differences into account or alternatively, you have a specific set of priors for, for example, for DCD curves and a specific set of priors for IRM acquisition and so on. I, I think I'd probably go with the first option that you just put it, mm -hmm. make the priors quite vague. Um, and hopefully that, that covers the variability between different measurement types. Have you thought about the database of separates? Database of what, sorry? Of uh, separates, magnetic separates of um, different minerals and different grain size fractions and try to get your a priori knowledge from those yeah I mean, of what, our techniques and sure so again any anything can feed into that prior i mean there, there's always the the concerns with um you know if you're working with magnetic separates or um you're working with synthetic samples interactions are always a concern um but yeah any information that can go into the prior can be can be used thank you
Okay, thanks. Um, I think uh, Max has been generous giving us another five minutes for questions. Um, thanks, Dave, for helping us to, to understand the challenges to approximating reality. They're, they're really significant. And I think as a community, we need to be thinking harder about this particular challenge. Um, I'll turn back to Anna. Yeah, thanks. Uh, 